As you see, it's a new venue, and we tried to figure things out. We're going to see how it goes. I like it, pretty much like it. I hope John feels inspired today, and so we can share all his vastness of knowledge. Anyways, I think more or less today, everybody here has been here before. I've seen like one, two, three, four, four, five. Uh, yeah, yeah, new, new people. people. Everybody, everybody else has been here before. before. So, so this is our music talks. talks. We're, We're going to try this venue for the first time. time. We want it to be quite intimate, anyways. So, so just for, for the formal part, the Dark Music Talks is a series of discussions with experts, with people that know stuff, and we're here because we want to know stuff. And we're going to start an informal discussion so everybody can become a little bit better in what we do. So this is a discussion. We're here to interact. It's going to be the microphone, microphone that you can talk with. And we're here to, to learn and, and be relaxed. So you can get a beer. You can go to the toilet anytime. You can go walk around, whatever you want to do. Just feel comfortable. Um, so the cool, no, no you, no you, no you. You're not allowed to do anything. Just stay there. Don't talk. So something really nice, this thing right now. There's not so many people. I don't know if they got lost because it's a new venue. But this thing is the fifth country that is happening. So the last month I'll be traveling for one week in, in each place. And we have one similar event in Italy, one in Portugal, one in Ukraine, and one in Greece. And we have more countries to follow. So it's becoming a global thing, talking about the music industry, how to become a musicpreneur, a musician, an artist, a music person that will understand how the music ecosystem works. Anyways, enough from me. Um, I hope you enjoy. And Mr. John Morta, would you like to come on stage and talk? Okay. Hello. He's a little bit drunk, so don't ask difficult questions. This one is for you. I was going to say, if you put your shades on so you can see the screen, um, please, if you could will the sun to go down. So uh, that's good, because it's quite visual heavy, this, so it's going to be quite interesting at times. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you're going to be looking at some very white screen, but uh, if it does go like that, I will try and explain it as best possible. And um, hopefully you can get my Essex accent well enough so that you can understand what the hell's going on. Um, and my name is John Morta. Thank you very much for inviting me, Tommy, um, to uh, one of your legendary talks. And I'm very honoured to be here, so thank you very much. Um, I do love this venue. I love the fact that you've got sofas. And I like the fact that the first time you get sofas is the time when I can't actually sit on one because I'm standing up. So thanks very much for that. Um, yes, um, yeah, my name is John Morton. The reason why I'm here, I've, uh, I've been asked today, is to tell you a story more than anything. Um, it's a story, a social media story that includes a lot of the music industry. And it's kind of um, uh, what happened to me in a, probably in a, a very crazy a uh, few months of my life uh, that four years later I'm still being asked along to do crazy stuff like this. So, um, so I hope you enjoy it. If you don't, tell me. Uh, if you do, tell someone else. I think is that how you're supposed to do it, or is it the other way around? I don't know. Or, or, or just yeah, or just stick your fingers up at me and tell me to fuck off or something. I, sorry, I do swear. I, I apologise now. Um, so anyway, I um, where do we start? Well, this. You can probably just see vaguely there. This is my PC, my Mac, sorry, at home. Um, it's quite untidy. That's, that's quite an untidy desk. And uh, this is kind of where the whole story starts, really. Uh, it was not only when I got a Mac, but when I decided to, um, uh, to play around with this thing called social media. And this is sort of back in 2007, 2008. And um, there is a stereotypical picture of social media icons for you that every presentation, there must be one along the years that you've been to where you get lots of weird social media icons in a weird sort of splatter on screen there. Um, now, there was one particular social media uh, or social um, uh, network that I, I sort of got into quite quickly, and uh, that was Twitter. And in about 2007, I joined Twitter, um, and that's when I started to tweet people like Stephen Fry, and hoping, and pretty sure he was going to reply to me, but he, he never, never did. Um, so anyway, so that's how I started out. And the thing with Twitter was, it's, it's very, and it still is, it's very 
new. It's very whatever's out happening at the moment. Um, every piece of news, any piece of major news in the last few years, I found through Twitter first before anything else. And even back then in 2008, I noticed that that was, that was kind of what it was turning into. And so I, being me, I thought, well, no, I'm not going to use it for news. I'm going to try and just see if I can break it and see if I can do my own thing. And so what I decided to do is rather than talk about what I was doing now, um, I thought I'd just try trolling and talk about what happened in the 80s and see who would pick me up and say, what the hell are you talking about, you idiot? So I decided to um, try uh, these, these newfangled thing called hashtags. And, uh, and I, I wrote a hashtag called 80s tweets. And what I was doing is I was tweeting, rather than tweeting what was currently happening at the moment, I was actually tweeting about what was happening in about 1985. And every tweet I did was from the 80s. Uh, so I was talking about that new TV show called EastEnders, and it's never going to last a year, won't, won't last at all. Uh, the new Michael J. Fox film, Back to the Future, and uh, things like that, okay? And I just did it for a joke, it was just for a laugh, and that was all it was for. So this started on a Monday morning in a cafe in London Bridge on my iPod Touch, and I actually found some Wi-Fi, which was, in those days was, was astonishing. So anyway, so I, I made this tweet, and I started tweeting about these old TV shows, and just thought it was funny, and kind of forgot about it. Anyway, come Tuesday, Wednesday, some of my friends were also using it. And I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, okay, not bad. Um, and then, come Friday, something else weird happened. Um, it, it trended number one in the world, right? <laughs> and, uh, it's a bit vague, because it's, it's, it's quite bright in here, but basically, that's a quite a nice pie chart. It's not as good as Ian's pie chart, if you saw Ian's talk a few months ago, because he does the best pie charts on presentations. Um, that's a pie chart. Um, what it would say, if you could see it, um, it's basically the biggest part of that pie is my hashtag because the Americans got hold of it and thought it was wonderful and they just thought it was brilliant so they just started tweeting anything that was to do with the 80s Knott's Landing and stuff like that anyone, uh, food, anyone? no? good um, so uh, if it's not taken I'm starving um, so it trended number one in the world and this is my first ever foray into social media and I thought to myself, well, shit, I'm pretty good at this then. I can do this social media thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm all right. Excellent. That's a new career. Well, maybe not. So anyway, um, <laughs> so I was king of the world. There we are. There's me on the, on the Titanic. I didn't fall in, though. Um, and I, I felt like DiCaprio and thought, well, this is easy. I can do this. And uh, anything I touch from now on will turn to gold. Surely. Surely. Um, so anyway, um, I'll move along a little bit and just change the subject slightly. The Christmas number one is, is uh, something which I hope you're all familiar with. Uh, if you're not, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> but uh, the Christmas number one is uh, something that since I was a kid I really loved and always followed and wondered who was going to be Christmas number one in, in a particular year. Uh, there were occasions I had bets on it when I was in my teenage years. And um, you had, um, you know... Some art, great artists got Christmas number one over the years. This Slade, of course, we all know their, their Christmas number one. Uh, again, if you don't, I'd probably suggest you leave now, actually, because you're not going to get the rest of this, but uh, Slade. Uh, you've also got Band-Aid, of course, had a Christmas number one in uh, 1984. And, uh, of course, Bob the Builder had a Christmas number one in the year 2000. Now, his one was, I think, my favourite of the lot because Bob the Builder prevented Westlife getting the Christmas number one that year. So I think, I think Bob is, is a legend in anyone's book. Um, so actually, so lots of, that just proves that there's lots of different types of tracks and songs. And th th there's not a formula to it. It was just a bit of fun. And uh, uh, next slide, please. And uh, so anyway, but then this guy turned up in about 2004, 2005. And every single year we were getting an X Factor winner was the Christmas number one single. I mean, it had to go to Christmas number one because they had a three month advertising campaign called the X Factor to help the single along. And I got a bit fed up with this because after every, every year, and I think four years in a row, um, I kind of got a bit teed off and thought, well, why is no one doing anything? Why, is, why are there no bands releasing something in Christmas week? 
And it was kind of getting me really down. Genuinely, it was getting me down. I'm sad, it's fine, it's okay, you can laugh, it's not a problem, but uh, it was really annoying me. And so I thought to myself, well, okay, um, what, can, what can be done here? I'm just some idiot in the middle of Essex with an internet connection. I haven't, I'm not in a music industry, I ha I'm not in a band, um, I'm just, in all intents and purposes, I'm a nobody. But I'm pissed off with this. I can't be the only one. So, uh, next slide, please. So, I had an idea, okay, now bearing in mind that obviously I'm a social media expert, yeah, because of the, yeah, 80s tweets and all that, okay, good, yeah, just, I didn't want you to forget that bit. Um, I had this wicked idea, and I thought, I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to create some sort of campaign to see if we can get another Christmas number one, someone else that isn't the X Factor, and knowing the chart rules, or I, th I think I know the chart rules, because downloads count now, um, and this is 2008, by the way. Downloads count. So in theory, if we all buy a download at the same time, then I can kind of create my own Christmas number one. And that was quite exciting. I thought, actually, why has no one else done this yet? So I, I used Facebook, and I was on Facebook, and I, was, I liked trying to break things, and I, I still do to this day. I love trying to break Facebook and seeing if I can just ruin it. Um, they don't like me, but I still do it. Anyway, and I had an idea, so I thought, right, let's make a Facebook campaign. And we needed a hero, so um, Rick Astley I chose. I chose Rick Astley. Because, is anyone familiar with the Rick role? Yeah, yeah, yeah good, yeah, some nods. Okay, anyone that's not familiar with a Rick role, um, it's one of those annoying videos where you think you're clicking on something exclusive, something that you've never seen before, something like, you know, the Beatles originally wrote Rapper's Delight or something like that, and here's pretty, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, you think, oh, wow, what's that? But when you click on it, it's Rick Astley singing Never Gonna Give You Up. That's the joke, okay? It's been going around for years, and I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute, why don't we Rick Roll the, the UK? We can Rick Roll the whole country, okay, uh, by getting him to the Christmas number one instead of the X Factor. And I thought that was a wicked idea. I thought, right, I'm going to do this. I'm really going to do this. So, off I went. And uh, I created this campaign, very off the, off the cuff, called the Ultimate Rick Roll. And the idea was, uh, it's, you can't quite see there, that I'll, I'll explain what the pictures are in a second, but the idea was is that uh, everybody was going to join, and the week before Christmas, everyone was going to download, never going to give you up from iTunes or from Amazon or whoever it was at the time. And uh, if thousands of you did it, hey, we're going to have a number one single. So what I did, you probably can just about see there, we, I made a very crude logo on Photoshop. And as you can probably tell, my Photoshop skills are crap then, and they still are now, actually. But, um, but I made this crap logo, and I noticed something really weird, that other people were not only sort of using my logo, but they were adding to it. So for example, we had like um, a radio, st on the left-hand side is Vogue FM. And they took my logo and they, made, they changed their logo for their Facebook page. So it included the Rick Astley campaign. Um, I also had Weeble forums, which in, in 2008 was a pretty big forum. It was a lot of people on there. They changed their whole logos, so that it added Rick Astley. Um, you, the third one along, you probably can't quite see, but it's, I can assure you, it's a picture of, R of Phil Collins. Um, and, and the Phil Collins official UK fan club thought it was such a good idea that they changed the logo and they put Phil Collins in instead, even though they wanted to buy, you know, Rick Astley. Um, and so this was pretty crazy, and, it, and I thought, bloody hell, you know, this, there's thousands and thousands of people joining. I even got offered a, an interview on Channel 5 News at 4 p.m. in the afternoon when no one's watching it. So I was quite, you know, I thought, Christ, I can be on telly here. This is brilliant. So I did go on telly. And um, anyway, by the end of it, I managed to get 68,000 people in a Facebook group, okay, to do this. And, I th and this, was, this was nosebleed territory for me by this time. I mean, I've never had anything to do with 68,000 people in my life before. So I thought, right, well, this is it. 68,000 people, it's a, it's a deal. We've done it, surely. They're all going to download Rick Astley. We're going to have a Christmas number one. And uh, I'm going to get on the telly and uh, gloat to the nation. So this is going to work. Anyway, so the chart, uh, camp, the, the chart uh, week came around 
Um, yeah, we didn't quite do it. Alexandra Burke from the X Factor uh, got Christmas number one. So we didn't get, as you can see, we didn't get top three, unfortunately. We tried. Um, uh, we actually got uh, uh, Christmas number 73 in 2008, um, which I was quite pleased with, actually. But uh, looking at it back, it was, it was pretty crap. It wasn't good. Um, and then, if you remember, I talked to you about hashtags earlier, that I, I managed to get a number one trend with a hashtag. Well, this is where the hashtag came back and bit my ass big time, because uh, I became known as Fail uh, on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this, this, this uh, hashtag became my... Uh, around my neck, it really was. And I had so many tweets aimed at me with that hashtag on, going, you, f you failed, what the hell was that all about? That was crap. I hate you, and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, here's, I mean, we've got some examples. You could probably just read maybe what, uh, some of the questions here. Um, how could you do this? I spent £41 on downloads from Paul in Enfield there. Um, so that was one of the, one of the best ones there. Um, it's Kenneth. Ah, ha, ha. You couldn't organise a piss up in a brewery, mate. Um, was one of my favourites uh, favorites there. Um, what I like, the, the punk, the, the grammar is wrong, if you notice. So I, I got back to him on his grammar. And that was a bad move, actually, because you know, I got threats a lot. And, um, and uh, there's another, and, and then this one <laughs> from, from Alan uh, was... Um, Probably one, I mean, most of them actually came through a little bit like that. That's quite generic, actually. I got quite a lot like that one. Some were spelt right as well. So, um, you know, it wasn't just the uneducated that had a go at me. So, so yeah, it, it, it didn't work. And it, it kind of put me off social media, full stop, actually. And uh, I vowed I was never going to do anything ever like that ever again. Anyway, um, so... Yeah, the following year, these two idiots, this is Jedward, appeared on my TV screen. And do you know what? Something inside me snapped. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know what it was. It, I just, something just, I thought, nah, this is, this is not good. I can't, I can't have this. And this was in a week where they were, they were up the, in the favourites to win the X Factor. And I thought, fuck me, no way, this is, I'm just not having this one. So, not really listening to my own advice, um, I kind of, uh, I made another Facebook group for 2009. And I thought, okay, well I won't do a joke this time, I'm serious this time, I'm really going really gonna to stick it to them. And so I, I thought, right, I know what I'm going to do, I'll get one of my favourite bands, Rage Against the Machine, because Rage Against the Machine, not only are they cool, and uh, not only have they made one of the greatest albums ever created, in my opinion, but um, I just thought, Oh, if I use that Killing in the Name of song, it's got fuck in the song 17 times at the end. So it's going to piss a lot of people off. So that's great. That's, that's going to work. So I made a Facebook group. Um, November the 22nd, there you go, 2009 was the day that we made it. Uh, with one person, that was me. And, um, and off we went. Now, um, one person is, is not really very big. Okay. Um, obviously, I went to the previous group, the Rick Astley group, and said, hey, guys, I've got a cracking idea. Do you want to do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> so, now, I did that, but I thought, okay, well, if we're going to do this again, um, we've, we're going to have to do this differently. I'm going to have to grow up a little bit and think, right, well, okay, what did I fuck up last time, basically, and try not to do it again? And so uh, this is quite a key thing for me. And I, I, with any campaign and any artists, any uh, um, clients that I deal with, this is something as part of my mantra, really. Um, I, mistakes, there's nothing wrong with mistakes. They're fine. In fact, you don't get anywhere in life or with any campaign, with any band, unless you make screw-ups now and again. And boy, as you saw, I made quite a few, you know. Um, so what did I do? So I thought, I've got to do it differently this time. First of all, you can probably just see there, that's the official Charts Company logo. Um, what I didn't do in, for the Rick Astley campaign is I didn't actually read the bloody rules of the charts. <laughs> and what I found out a year later is that um, if you buy more than three downloads off the same email, the chart company spot it and they delete all the downloads. They don't count. So I was like, oh shit, 
last year I was telling people to get 10, you know. Um, Paul from Enfield bought 41 pounds worth. Oh, crap. Uh, right, so, uh, and I actually spoke to someone at the charts. I actually rang them up. I just did it, and I said, this is what I'm going to do. I know I'm the idiot from last year, but I'm going to have another go. I'm really sorry in advance, but this is what's going to happen. And so, um, but to be fair to them, they were really good. And they said, okay, look, you know, do this. Don't tell people to buy more than one, because we will see it, and we will basically delete anyone that's got uh, more than one from the same email address. That's how it works. I was like, oh, thank you very much. That's, that's given me a bit of information that I don't think you should have given to me, but, but thank you, and I'm sh I can assure you it won't go any further. So, um, <laughs> no, oh, no, no, I've not said a word, have I? No. Um, so anyway, so I, this chart rules, I downloaded the chart rules, printed them out, and it's about, um, for any of you that have seen the chart rule, Ian, you probably know, it's bloody thick, isn't it? There's a lot of pages in the official chart rules, and I read the lot on the train to work and back, for about two weeks, I read this bloody thing until I knew exactly what I was allowed to get away with and what I was allowed not to get away with. So I did that. That was one thing I did that, that I screwed up from the previous time. Uh, what I also did, and it's, you might find it a bit difficult to see that, um, what this side of the screen is, is uh, if any of you remember the groups, uh, do any of you in Facebook groups? I should start. Let's just get the basics. Great. You, you know what Facebook groups are. Well, um, the older style groups, you could tell who the admin was. You could see it gave the name in the corner of who the admin was and who was running, basically, who was running the show. And another thing you could do with Facebook groups in those days is you could have a, it was a brilliant little facility called Message All Members. And Message All Members was amazing. If, if you had X thousand in your group, you could literally message every single one. It wouldn't go on the news feed, it goes in their inbox. And it was brilliant. I thought, wow, that's. that's Potentially a very good marketing tool if anyone spots that. So, um, but what I was finding occasionally, and you might, if any of you guys have been on Facebook for a few years, you might remember that there used to be groups out there that didn't have an admin, that didn't have anyone in charge. You'd see, you know, there are no admins in this group sort of thing. And I worked out, because as I told you, I like to break things and I like to try and screw things up. I, I found out that if you join a group with no admin, and then, and then leave it, and then join it again. For some reason, Facebook thinks that you're a, a, a member for, since day one, and it offers you the admin's job. And I thought, well, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, so from the very top corner there, um, it's suddenly John Morta that was the new admin's name, because I worked out how to join it. I also worked out a Google prompt, to, something to stick into Google, to find all these empty Facebook groups with lots and lots of people. And so this example here, for example there, I suddenly became in charge of 2,554 members of a group that I could instantly message in their inbox. Yeah. Yeah, this is the bit the press didn't tell you. Um, so I thought, oh, that's, that, again, that's quite useful. So I went on Google, and, and uh, to cut a long story short, I found about 600 groups <laughs> that didn't have admins in. And I joined them all. And I, for some reason, I became the boss of all of them. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, this is useful because there's, well, if you, if you do the maths, 600 groups, and let's just say some groups have got a few hundred in, some have got 2,000. Um, and there was a particular Rage Against the Machine fan group that had 4,000 in it. I thought, well, I'm having that one for a start. And in those days as well on Facebook, I should mention, uh, you could also change the title of the group as well. You can't now, but you could in those days. So I thought, well, hang on a minute. This Rage Against the Machine group that I found, in theory, if I just extend the title a little bit to For Christmas Number One, I've now got two groups that look exactly the same. They're all identical, and, uh, but one's got loads of people in it and one hasn't. Well, that could be useful. So I sort of mould on that. Uh, and uh, also, while I was at it, I also found some other groups that I thought, well, I might as well join them and become their new boss. You never know. Um, I'm a big Nirvana fan, so there's 2,400 Nirvana fans I could message instantly. Uh, Celtic, I, I'm not, I'm a, for my sins, I'm a Spurs fan, but uh, I, I'm, I'm boss of a Celtic fan group um, in Scotland. I like sliding across wooden floors in my socks. 4,800, they know what they're talking about. I'm the boss of that one too. Um, buying and selling in Runcorn. I've never been to bloody Runcorn. Um, but again, I'm their admin. 
and uh, dog walkers in Vancouver, 3,300. I haven't even got a dog. I don't like dogs, but I'm their boss. I'm, I'm, I run that group. So you can sort of work out the difference in numbers there of people in the groups, okay? And again, you remember what I said, that you can message every single member of that group uh, in the old days on Facebook. So if you put, the, put it all together, about 600 Facebook groups, I'm trying to look for all the big ones with lots of thousands of people in. You can probably work out where I'm taking this one. And um, I don't, as I said, what I did as well was I, uh, I, as I said, I found that anything to do with rock music, anything Rage Against the Machine, anything like that at all, and they had no admin, this guy here was the brand new boss of it, and uh, it was going to be mine. So, thanks. So, that's all very well. So I had loads and loads of these Facebook groups with lots and lots of people in, okay? Um, and I thought, well, there must be a way I can use them. And I did in a way. Um, what the, one thing that I find is, is all very well is that social media is great. You can have numbers, numbers, numbers. And I'm finding more and more, to, I think, to its detriment is that more and more people are looking at, at Facebook metrics or, or Twitter metrics and think, right, well, they've got more fans, they've got more followers, therefore that's more valid. Which, personally, I think is bollocks. I really do. Um, but either way, you can have all that, but you need some PR. You need... You need to step out of social media. You, you can't just rely on it to get something, to make something work. I've always believed that, and I still do. And if any of you guys were at Ian's talk a few months ago, uh, where he was talking about the traditional model, where you can't just rely on digital, uh, I'm a firm, firm uh, in agreement with that and, and believer. Um, so social and digital is just one part of the pie. I'm bringing pie back in again, aren't I? Sorry, that, was, that wasn't intended. Um, but I very much believe it. Anyway, um, if I can ask a quick question, has anyone heard of Red Radio? Loads of no's, and that's good, I'm glad you haven't, because it's a tiny, tiny little radio station in Essex, where I'm from, uh, from Colchester. It's their students' uh, own radio station. And I happen to know one of the DJs that was on at sort of the drive time, five o'clock sort of slot. And I got in touch and said, can I come on your radio show and talk about my, my Facebook campaign? And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. We only get about 20 listeners and a dog every week. So, yeah, you, you're more than welcome. So what I did is I went on Red Radio. But what I did is I went to lots of these Facebook groups. And I basically teased them into, with the link and said, you've got to tune in at 5 p.m. UK time. I've got some very, very important Facebook news that you need to know. So tune in. So that's exactly what we did. Um, and bear in mind, the, the Rage Against the Machine group at this time has started to pick up and started to gain lots and lots of new followers. And so I went on this radio station, and uh, I had an interview, and I said exactly what I'm doing. And lots of people from around the country are tuned in as well. Now, this is a station that's only used to a very limited amount of listeners. And I noticed they had a little chat box in the corner of their website. It was very twee. It was only literally sort of, you know, the moderator and a, a few people here, a few students that were obviously drunk or something, just chatting away. And so what I said to every single person on my Facebook groups, on the Rage of Facebook group, I said, I want you to get on that chat site and say hello, all of you, as many as you can. And that's exactly what they did. And we crashed the server. The, the, the university, or one of the university servers, went down under the pressure. We had too many people. The DJ, a uh, guy called um, uh, uh, James, was just astonished. He was like, we've never had, this is unprecedented. We've never had this amount of listeners ever in our lives. What is going on? And we took the server down, which is all very well. You know, nothing major, nothing major. But what I thought I'd do with that is um, I went to the Essex Chronicle, which is one of the sort of, you know, it's, it's a in the, sort of the Essex area where I am. It's quite a big newspaper. And I went to them and said, do you realise that Essex University's whole servers all went down last night? Did you hear about that? No, what's all that about then? Yeah, the whole, all the servers went down. Have you, you not seen? Have you not, did you not hear? No. You better get hold of it. In fact, ring DJ James so-and-so. Here's his number. Um, because, yeah, the whole thing went. Anyway, to cut a long story short there, um, the Essex Chronicle did a story on it. So... It was bullshit because the, the whole of Essex Chronicle service, sorry, the whole of Essex University service didn't go down, but I made out that it had done. For the reason being that I thought they're more likely to make a story out of that, and they did, and they put it in the paper and they put it on their website. Bonus. Great. That's a story I can use. 
And uh, it ended up with me on Sky News uh, within two days. And the reason why I ended up on Sky News is because this little story that really wasn't a story at all, that I'd made out that had broken the whole, uh, or, or the whole of the department's servers, um, helping the Chinese whispers along a little bit, we made out that we took the whole of Essex University's computer system down, which Sky liked. I thought, well, fuck me, that's, how did you do that? Shit, do you want to come on and tell us? Yeah, no problem, no problem at all, I'll come on. So I, I managed to sort of grice my way onto Sky News at 6pm. And, uh, and, and I said, well, the reason why we did it is because of the Rage Against the Machine campaign. You must have heard of it. No, no, we haven't. What do you mean you haven't heard of it? What the hell? You call yourselves journalists. You've not heard of that. For God's sake, come on. Look, get me on the, on the telly and I'll explain a little bit more. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, OK. All right. Yeah, on you come. So um, I went on to uh, Sky News. There I am there. And this is sort of prime time news. And, um, and that was, I thought, brilliant. This is it. I've got onto Sky News. And um, what I did, you can't quite see there, but I was wearing a t- work I've got today. If you can see what I'm wearing, I've got an overshirt here, and I've got a T-shirt underneath, right? Now, as you can see it there, it just says Echor, Pillar Echor, right? It's actually Spiller's Records. But what I was wearing was a T-shirt saying Olok, okay? It had Olok written on there. So it actually looked like it said Bollocks. But it, it didn't. It didn't say that. And I wore this shirt saying Olek. And once, I've been, once I came off air, I tweeted to a lot of my friends, and I, I messaged a lot of my friends, and I said, can you ring in, and can you email Sky News, and can you complain about the guy on the, on the T-shirt, with the, the, the dodgy T-shirt, right? <laughs> and, uh, and they did, and we got about 200 complaints. <laughs> And Sky got in touch with me, and they had to, and they, and they said, well, "We didn't even notice you were wearing a T-shirt." So, well, I'm really sorry about that. But that again, it's another story that I, it's an extra thing that I layered on top of it. It's another little story that out of nothing, that I thought, if we're going to get this to work, I need as many people as I can to talk about what I want them to talk about. And however you do it, hook or crook, whatever, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so it led to other things. Channel 5 News, after the year before, uh, came back and put me on their peak time slot about this Rage Against Machine campaign. CNN got in touch, going, are you the guy that, that put shit or something on your shirt or something like that? Yeah, that's, that's me. Ah, oh, cool, we, we'll have to chat to you about your... your uh, I'll, f- I'll forget the accent, I'm sorry. Um, but you get the idea. <laughs> Triple M Radio, Australia. <laughs> Australia got in touch, so can we have a chat to you? Are you the guy that went on and, and swore on telly? I hadn't, but again, this is all these Chinese whispers. Yeah, that's me. If anyone's going to hype you, let them do it, and if they don't hype you, make it up, right? And then Radio 5 Live. Now, this is where we went into the big league, because Radio 5 Live, don't ask me why, I don't know, but Radio 5... Um, decided that they were going to try and get hold of the band Rage Against the Machine and see if they'll play live on the breakfast show. And I remember they telling me about it, and I was like, no chance. They've split up. They're not together at the moment. That's not going to happen. Anyway, um, and... Uh, oh, hello. Uh, that's the one. Um, so I thought, no chance. Anyway, the ba- Tom Morello, the guitarist of Rage Against the Machine, got in touch with me. He tweeted me, and he said, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to play at 3 a.m. our time in a garage in Los Angeles, because we love the idea of the campaign. And it's just an excuse to have a good laugh. And we're like, brilliant, okay, yeah, great. So at 8 a.m. Uh, on December the 17th, uh, 2009, Rage Against Machine reformed because of my Facebook group. <laughs> that, that I, thank you. Um, they, they reformed in a garage in Los Angeles at 3 a.m. to play live down the phone to Radio 5 Live in London, right? Now, Radio 5 Live isn't music, is it? It's all news. It's not music. So I was thinking, Christ, what, what are they doing? Like, <laughs> what are they going to do? And I thought it was just going to be a, a, a sort of a little snippet, and I thought they were going to talk, you know, have a little chat. But no, they did the whole song, right? And um, for those of you, as I mentioned earlier, the refrain at the end of the song basically screams, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, 17 times at the end. And just before we went on air, I was actually privy. I could hear what the studio was saying. 
And uh, I could hear the studio manager saying, no, it's all right, they're not going to say anything. So uh, we've had a word, and uh, it's, uh, don't worry, they're, uh, they're going to censor themselves, it's all good. Um, <laughs> so they played the song, and it got near the end, and I was sitting there, and I was actually sitting in the studio, and you could see the sweat beads on Nicky Campbell's head, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and they played this track. And all I can say is, is that Zach De La Rocha, the lead singer of uh, Rage Against the Machine, started to censor himself at the end. And you could see everyone in the studio's shoulders just go, ah, it's good, it's all right, it's all right. And suddenly you hear Zach De La Rocha go, fuck, really loud. <laughs> and he kept screaming, fuck, really loud, really quickly. <laughs> and I'm sitting there with headphones on in the studio, thinking, oh shit, this is going to be brilliant. Twitter's going to go nuts. <laughs> and, uh, and Sheila Fogarty, who was co-presenting, just panicked. And she, stood, she literally just stood up out of her chair and like, started doing that and sat down again. And, so, and it, was just, it was like headless chickens. It was so good. It was one of the best moments of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and suddenly, Sheila Fogarty screams out. And if you listen, it's on YouTube. Go and check it out. You, Sheila Fogarty, she goes, get rid of it. Get, get rid of it. And it goes... And that was it, that was it. I didn't care after that. I said, right, this, I think this might just work. Anyway, once I was escorted from the BBC, because <laughs> they thought it was me, um, so I actually got escorted out, the, out of BBC TV Centre, God bless it, um, and it was one that it was fantastic. I got escorted out of BBC TV Centre, and I went straight on my phone, and Twitter had gone nuts. It was brilliant. I just felt so, oh. It's one of those moments you get when you think, oh, fantastic, look at that. Everyone is going for it on Twitter. This is fantastic. Oh, yes. And I've been banned, from, I've been chucked out of the BBC. So I can go and tell all my mates because none of them have done that. So, you know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and the following morning, the Daily Mirror put on the front page XXX Factor. We made the front page of the Daily Mirror. <laughs> and uh, and um, basically, um, Simon Cowell had heard about all this fracas and what had been going on, and he weren't very happy at all. Because he'd heard that I was uh, um, trying to go up against the, uh, the X Factor, and um, what was brilliant was that not only did we get front page of the Daily Mirror, and they name-checked me on the front page as well, so that's, again, that's going to the grave, front page of a tabloid, I, wasn't, I was quite pleased with that, and it wasn't the sun which made it better as well. Um, front page, Simon Cowell, uh, that very day, by sheer fluke, had the X Factor final conference. Now, they do this every year before the X Factor final, uh, and what they do is they have all the X Factor finalists, all of the judges, all on a big panel, and they invite the press along. 